apontesis, parables, last days, etc., etc. Hello, everyone. My name is Al Person. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church. That is my email address or in the comments below. Thank you for comments as they come in. I've got a few to address going forward. Well, today's topic is an eschatology related topic. Again, I like to do most of these before the Easter season, but um, the time just came up on us this year and it's like, wow. Uh, the reason I like to do that and give that window is that the Lord preached the Olivet Discourse just prior to his crucifixion. So there's no real reason that I need to do that. It's just kind of, um, it, it kind of works as I roll year by year. I've been uh, pastoring now for nearly 40 years, so you learn a couple of tricks over that time. Speaking of tricks, we're still trying to get the video and audio presentation to work comfortably because I don't have a studio. I have to set up every time in my office and um, have to be sure that it's kind of right. And there's a lot to do. And if you have a studio, then you have everything all set up. You have you use the same equipment every week, same camera, same camera setting, same audio, everything. So at least you don't have that variable that has to happen from time to time. Well, I have natural light and all those other things going on. I don't really want to put up two artificial lights here because I've got to work at this desk upon which my camera is sitting and it would just get in the way. But we'll see how we go. And no, don't take up an offering to buy me a studio or anything like that will manage quite all right. Okay, so the topic today has to do with whether or not the doctrine of the rapture is biblical. What is the doctrine of the rapture? That is the doctrine that teaches that before the second coming, the Lord would take the church, that is all believers, away from the earth into heaven with him so that the remaining time that was allocated to Israel, the Jewish time clock, could be run out, could be fulfilled. Now, the doctrine of the rapture was invented, or it came to John Nelson Darby almost 200 years ago. That's right, almost 200 years ago. And it has very much fallen out of favor, uh, and it's been kind of pulled apart over time, but um, the events of the mid uh, of the 2020s and beyond have caused a lot of people to go back to that kind of thinking and review it and so on. I'm going to be doing probably a playlist on this topic and this will be number one I think in that playlist. I have to think about that. I'm not sure how that will go. So ultimately the doctrine of the rapture teaches that at some time in some particular way God would raise up or cause his people to be pulled off the earth in a miraculous form caught up to meet him in the air and uh, would therefore be with the Lord after that time. And this would not be the second coming. This would be a specific event sometime before. Uh, one wonders what would happen to things like wooden legs and um, uh, implants in bodies and dentures and fillings and so on. I, I don't really know. What about the clothes? I'm not sure. And of course, uh, the whole rapture thing caused a lot of consternation years ago where airlines would uh, uh, not put two Bible-believing Christians in the um, uh, captain and co-pilot seat just in case they were raptured away and the plane would crash. Hmm. Well, you know, I guess you have to think things through. We're going to have a look at a couple of those passages that Darby used and that are commonly used over the weeks to come. Probably not, definitely not every week, but maybe once in a while, and maybe not even connected to my Sunday message. I might just do some fill-ins. The first text that we are going to spend some, pay some, uh, give some time to, which is today's passage, is 1 Thessalonians 4.17. I'm going to do this at quite a superficial level, but I think you'll get an idea as to how to think some of these things through. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Well, that scripture on the face value, on face value looks exactly like the rapture. Uh, those who are uh, alive, well, we're still alive, we're left, we'd be uh, caught up somehow, we'll meet the, the Lord in the air, etc., etc. Hmm, okay, I guess maybe that's what it's talking about. Well, we need to crack this passage open. I'm going to start with one word that's as far as we will get today. And, uh, and we'll see how we go with this most interesting of words. How did I do this? Well, I'm going to put up on the screen the approach that I use that really anybody can do. You can do this too. It's not that hard to do. And I'll instruct you simply with some uh, screenshots. 
If you go to Blue Letter Bible, Blue Letter Bible uh, .org, I think it is, could be dot, I think it's .org, and uh, pop in First Thessalonians 4:17. In my example, you can choose any court beginning translation that you want. It will show you the Textus Receptus text. That's the only downfall, really, of Blue Letter Bible is it only uses the Textus Receptus. But for this purpose, it's quite fine. There's no variant. And now it might. It might use other um, Greek text than the Receptus. I don't think it does. So what then happens? Well, you can have a look. You can see it. You can uh, troll down. If you click the word, the verse, you'll get the Greek, um, or in the case of an Old Testament, words that are there. Now you notice this G529 here. That's the Strong's Greek number. That's going to help us in this case. Doesn't always, but it will here. You notice the word for to meet is apontesis. And uh, when you click into it, you can see where apontesis is used, plus you can get a dictionary definition of this or a theological de definition, and there's more. It'll go to, the, to Thayer's and so on. We note that it's used in Matthew 25, 1, 25, 6, 28, 15 of Acts, and our passage, which was 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. So this is useful. Now, if you troll down a little bit farther, it will bring all these relevant passages previously just listed, but it's going to show you this line as well if you're in the New Testament, which is view Old Testament results in the LXX Greek concordance. This is very significant for this study because that's saying you can look at it in the Septuagint. Okay, so the verse that we're going to be using is this one. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. And we're going to be looking at these four, pa these four references, but three passages to start. Now, before I go on, let me just explain to you what the Septuagint is. For those who might not know, new to the channel, the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek by an estimated 70 scholars. 70, hence the Septuagint name. And I don't know they know for sure that it was 70 scholars. This was done a long time ago, in, uh, uh, nearly 2,000 years ago. Now, what that means is that you can look at words like apentesis and see how apentesis was used according to Greek thought of the day. Uh, actually, it was before 2,000 years ago because, yeah, mm, let me just get back to that. No, I think it was before because uh, that was silly of me because it, um, the Septuagint is quoted in the New Testament. Funny how you uh, don't have the audience to look at you and say, you got that wrong, Al, or repeat it again or whatever. Well, moving right along, the Septuagint is very useful because you can say, well, how did the Greek scholars of the day use particular words when they referred to Old Testament Hebrew texts? So that's really important. Well, we will and we'll note that this, well, it's going to be important in our study. Now, you'll notice also that I that there's two references in the book of Matthew for the word meat, apentesis, that we're looking at in the meet the Lord in the air phrase in our reference. I hope that's clear. Two, now let's pop the story up or the parable up, then I'll make some, make some comments. This is the parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins. The Lord is teaching this and he goes on to and he says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom, a pentesis. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom come out to meet him, a pentesis. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So in this particular parable, the word apentesis is used twice. And in each case, it talks about the young women, the virgins, going out to meet the bridegroom, 
who was coming into the city to meet his bride, or coming into the community to meet his bride. The sense here is not the bridegroom meeting these young women and taking the five away with him. No, it is the visiting dignitary who's being met outside of the city. And this is the reference. If you look up Apentesis, uh, you can Google it, you'll note several references saying exactly that. This is what the word means. It's a very strong meaning. Now, people have asked, um, um, you know, what do you do with this parable? In fact, this is a very interesting parable. Let me just make an aside here. All parables were only applicable to the blindness of Israel, including this parable. It is important to note that no, dis no apostle, no one after the death of the Lord Jesus Christ ever used a parable. None of them even quoted the parables. None of them referenced the parables as, as some sort of an, um, an ethical tool or to teach an ethical truth. It's really important to note parables had a unique place in a unique time, and they were used by a totally unique person, essentially, that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul never used a parable. The apostles never used parables. It's very interesting. Let's just review this very quickly from a previous talk that I have given to you on this subject about the importance of parables here. And the Lord says, when he introduced, this is recorded in three of the four gospels with the first parable preached. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So this is very interesting, just going on down the passage a little farther. Um, Oh, we'll just continue here. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So this is speaking about the Lord's ministry. And um, he speaks to his disciples in Mark chapter 4. I'm, I'm going to, we just have to drive this home with this passage. So let me go here to Mark 4, 10 to 12. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you it has been given, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and they may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And again, in Mark 4, further on, he says the same thing, that um, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. And sometimes the disciples had to ask, in Luke chapter 12, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? So sometimes there was a question among, in his disciples as to who the parable was for or whatever. All the disciples understood the meanings of the parables, it was interpreted to them. There was no lack of clarity. Anybody comes on today and says, I have a new application of the parables for you for this day that applies to this day. You can say, nope, that's not what Jesus said. Don't go doing that. Why do we preach the parables? To demonstrate Jesus' faithfulness to Old Covenant Israel, to the church of the day, and the fulfillment of all prophecy. So let's look. So coming back to this prophecy about the, or this parable, <laughs> I almost got myself there, about the uh, the ten virgins. The term apentesis is used here. It's important to understand. The bridegroom did not come and take them away. He came and visited. Uh, they came, they visited him along the way and brought him into the city. So that's really critical. Now, is this word used elsewhere in the New Testament? Well, what we need to do is go on. We'll have a look again at our reference that we found from Blue Letter Bible, and we'll note that the passage, the word apentesis, appears in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, which is our reference. It appears in Matthew 25.1, Matthew 25.6, 
passage we just looked at, and once more in Acts 28, 15. Now, Acts 28 is a passage that we speak about frequently as a um, uh, as something that people just ignore. They, they'll, they don't quite get the weight of Acts 28. Acts 28 is very, very weighty, especially in this subject of eschatology. Very weighty. Paul is coming into the city, and on his way into the city, Paul is very important, this visiting dignitary thing. And I'm going to read some dignity, some definitions uh, for you in just a moment from the, um, uh, from the wider web. But as he comes into the city, he's being met. Let's have a look at this passage and see, because this again is the word apentesis. Here we go. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. So the brothers came out to meet. The brothers came out to meet Paul. And that is very, very interesting and very important because, um, well, in its own right, it's important. But what's also important is that um, we see how apentesis is used. Okay, quickly let's recap apentesis, then go back to a Septuagint comment, then back to our verse. What we've seen in the parable of the virgins, in the visit from Acts, is the word apentesis is used to refer to a group of people or a, a delegation going out to meet a dignitary. A delegation going out to meet a dignitary. Now I'm going to pop my glasses on, open up some uh, definitions down here, and read them to you as I found them, and you can do this too. This is not hard. Okay, so um, the word apentesis is from sermonindex.net. This comes from Precept Austin. In Greek culture, the word had a technical meaning to describe the visits of dignitaries to cities where a visitor would formally would be formally met by the citizens. Aha, uh -huh, very good. And from in JSTOR, there's a reference to Hellenistic formal receptions and Paul's use of apentesis. That's a book I've got to download, with, where it talks about a visiting dignitary might be met on the way to a city. And in gonefishing.org, the uh, conclusions of the, <laughs> of the writer are completely wrong, but uh, she does make a good point. The Apostle Paul does this by turning the traditional horizontal images of a visiting dignitary approaching a delegation. And so she actually argues against this point in a pretty lame way, I have to say. So this is this sense of a dignitary is coming to the city, a party is going out to meet him. Now, what about the Septuagint? The word apentesis appears, I counted it 32 times in the Old Testament in, from the Septuagint, some say 28, maybe there's a variation. What's the Septuagint again? The Septuagint is a Greek translated translation by ancient Greek scholars of the Hebrew Bible. Why was this done? Well, Greek was the, the, lang, the, ling, the basic language, the language of, of commerce in, in the first century and for many years, and even leading up before then. They needed some way to have access to the scriptures, so the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. About 70 scholars were involved. They used the word apentesis. They used other words for meat, but in no reference to apentesis do we ever get a sense of, the, of a visiting dignitary coming and taking the, uh, the party away we always either get the sense of just a meeting or of I'm going out to meet a dignitary and bring him into the city. You can look this up yourself. I was going to do that, but you know, I like to keep these down to the um, to less than 20 minutes. And how am I going? Oh, 19 minutes and eight seconds at the moment. So we always like to keep them tight. Now you can do that. You'll find out that if you look at every reference to a pentesis, it is really a, it's either just meeting or meeting a dignitary and bringing him into the city. Okay, what about the rapture? Why does the word apentesis do so much damage, if you will, to the doctrine of the rapture? 
Well, let's come back to our main text and make a couple of comments as we close today. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the cloud. I'm sorry, caught up together with them in the clouds to apentesis the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. If God is going to separate, and uh, if God is going to separate the church, the believers from others, that word apentesis doesn't work. If the Lord is coming in the air and then he's going to pull the church away and not come back to the earth, the word apentesis does not work, which is really, really interesting. The word apentesis argues in the face of that. So what does the scripture say? It says that the return, which we'll look at later on, the return of the Lord and the so-called rapture prophecy, those scriptures, talk about the same event. They're talking about welcoming the Lord to the earth. And uh, we'll do a lot more on eschatology later on. Nevertheless, we are left with this one major point today. The word apentesis alone, on its own, tells us that this passage about meeting the Lord in the air does not refer to him catching the people of God away off the earth and taking them somewhere else. Coming up, in weeks to come, we're going to look at the word air and how that does not refer to heavens at all, but the air around us. That's another interesting one. We'll look at harpazo, caught away. We'll also look at the, the catching away in the clouds or meeting him in the clouds. My, we have a lot to do. We're not going to do that next week. We'll uh, cherry pick these from time to time, but I'll put them on a playlist for you. My name is Al Person. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or in the comments below. God bless you. We will see you soon.